introducing you to the Swedenborg community of Victoria. Um, we were formerly known as the New Church and our old premises um, on High Street Road are still there, but they're currently occupied by another church. Um, and there's various artefacts in here on our, in our premises um, from, from the old building. So formerly known as the New Church, we're, we're affiliated with a group uh, in Australia called the New Church in Australia, which is an association of independent congregations um, who call themselves the New Church. And we're part of a small but worldwide fellowship, um, again, who co generally call themselves the New Church. And we, at our first meetings took place in May in 1787. So that's, that's um, where our church began. Um, and we take our cues from this gentleman, Emanuel Swedenborg, with thus the name Swedenborg Community Victoria. So he was born in Sweden in 1688. He was the son of a Lutheran bishop by the name of Jesper Swedberg. Now, his family was ennobled because of this man's service to his country. So from Swedberg, the family became Swedenborg. Um, it means burnt castle, I believe, as opposed to Swedberg, which was burnt hill. I don't speak Swedish, but that's my understanding of of burnt castle is Swedenborg, as opposed to burnt hill, which is um, Swedberg, the, the original family name. Now, um, Swedenborg, Emanuel Swedenborg was the only surviving son of the family, and he never married, and so the name died with him. Um, but Emanuel Swedenborg was a scientist, a philosopher, a theologian, and a mystic. And his early life was dedicated to the natural sciences. And he also served as the assessor of mines for the Swedish government, which meant that he spent a great deal of time traveling around Europe, uh, was collecting mining technologies for the government in Sweden. Um, but he's also thought to have been one of the last people who was able to master all of the known knowledge in, in the sciences at that time. If you think about when he was born, 1688, he died in 1772. Um, the, the knowledge of the sciences exploded. It, was really, it really grew at a, a vast pace from that time. And he's thought to be one of the last people to master all the sciences in his day. Now, he had very wide interests and he's credited with a few things. The first is, He's credited with designing the first flying machine that could have actually flown. The only thing that stopped it was they didn't have the power source available at the time, but it obeys all of the laws of aerodynamics and all those sorts of things. Um, he's also recognized as discovering um, cerebrospinal fluid in the brain. And he's the first person to propose a form of the nebula hypothesis. So a very intelligent man. Um, but you can see he's got very wide ranging interests over many different fields. Um, and as part of his interest in anatomy, he went looking for the human soul. And of course, he couldn't find a thing called the human soul in the body. But what it led him to was to engage in meditative practices. And he started recording and analyzing his dreams. Now, in 1743, he went on another one of his long journeys in, in Europe. And his custom was to write a diary of his journeys. But what happens was it turned into an inner diary. He started recording his dreams because it seems that his inner journey was much more interesting than his outer one was. And so he created this work. Um, and it was really just a notebook for his own use, which was published later. It became known as the Journal of Dreams. And in it, he records what is ultimately a spiritual crisis. He claimed to have met the Lord Jesus Christ in this spiritual crisis. And then we see him change direction in his life. Instead of a life focused on sciences, the natural sciences, he starts talking and writing about theology. So 
he claimed to have visited heaven and hell and he claimed to have daily contact with angels and spirits and all of this is under divine guidance under the the guidance of the lord and so in the second half of his life having been very well published in sciences in the first half in the second half he wrote 30 volumes of theology so a vast output over the total of his life so here's just a few of of the books that he wrote the first one is arcana celestia and i've got them out on the table if you want to have a quick peek 12 volumes of of work on the inner meaning of the books of genesis and exodus in the bible so it's a huge work and that was his first published spiritual book work and then this little one is a lovely little book new jerusalem and its heavenly doctrine it's a very short succinct summary of all of his kind of philosophy so if you want to get a short sweet you know what does swedenborg teach that's the book to go to his most popular book is called heaven and hell um, where he describes his journeys through the spiritual world and then he has other books like divine love and wisdom where he describes the being of god and the process of creation uh, my personal favorite is divine providence and it talks about things like why does God allow suffering to happen? Those sorts of issues. Uh, a book called Conjugal Love, which is all about marriage. And then his final book was called True Christian Religion. It's often published as two volumes. And again, it's a summary of everything he believed, but it's much thicker. It's a much bigger book than um, New Jerusalem, its heavenly doctrine. And it's very it's very much focused on Christian thinking and it's, it's addressed in Christian terms. So it's a, that's just something to hang on to. People Swedenborg influenced, people such as William Blake, John Chapman, also known as Johnny Appleseed, DT, oh, sorry, Ralph Waldo Emerson, DT Suzuki, the novelist, Russian novelist Dostoevsky, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, Helen Keller, and Carl Jung. It's all very well known people, um, very intellectual people who've been influenced by Swedenborg in some way. Um, what I want to do is just give you a, a quick run through what Swedenborg believes. Now, just preface this by saying this is a very personal um, understanding of Swedenborg's teaching it's what means something to me so there may well be gaps in fact there will be a lot of gaps because I don't have a very long period of time to summarize you know 30 volumes of work so this is very much my own what I appreciate about Swedenborg and his and his work so <clears throat> the first is on God now, Swedenborg's essential idea is once you grasp the essence of God, then everything else kind of falls out of that. It, it follows from that. And he says that Jehovah God is love itself and wisdom itself. That's it. That's how to understand God. And then he goes on and he writes, the essence of love is not to love self, but to love others and through love to be conjoined with them. It is also the essence of love to be loved by others, for thus is conjunction achieved. Now, for Swedenborg, the whole of God is all about love. And everything about the spirit, about the, the world in which we live, is all about love. And, and everything else about his theology flows from that. And you'll get a sense of that as we go on. Um, one of the most important beliefs we have is life after death. This is a scene from a recent Netflix movie called Things Heard and Seen. It starred Amanda Seyfried. It was published about a year ago, a bit over a year ago, and it featured Swedenborg's book, Heaven and Hell, which was quite interesting. Um, he's also been very influential with people like Raymond Moody, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, people who are investigating near-death experience, out-of-body experience, that sort of thing. And this is something that he wrote. Um, he said 
so that I might know that people do live on after death, I was allowed to talk to and mix with many whom I knew during their lifetime. And this has not been for just a day or a week, but for months and up to a year, I have talked to them and mixed with them just as I did in the world. They were utterly amazed that during their lifetime, like the majority of other people, they were so disbelieving that they thought they would not be alive after death, though in fact scarcely days stand between the death of the body and being in the next life, for it is a continuation of life. And that's his, that's his understanding of uh, life after death. Another movie that was influenced by Swedenborg, this is a one called What Dreams May Come, it was published about 1999, had Robin Williams in it, and it's based on a book by Richard Matheson, also called What Dreams May Come, um, influenced by Swedenborg's visions of, of the afterlife. But the thing is, what is heaven and hell? Basically, heaven and hell are inner states of life. They are states of being from which the spiritual world manifests itself. And this is the idea you actually pick up quite well from this movie if you've seen it. So he writes this. It can never be said that heaven is outside anyone. It is within. Because every angel accepts the heaven that is outside in keeping with the heaven that is within. We can see then how mistaken people are who think that getting into heaven is simply a matter of being taken up among the angels regardless of the quality of their inner life, who believe that heaven is granted merely because of the Lord's mercy. On the contrary, unless heaven is within an individual, nothing of the heaven that is outside flows in and is accepted. And heaven, at the end of the day, is love. It's, it's love for other people. And when we live in a state of love, we live in heaven. That, that's the idea. He also talks about the form of heaven. The reason I've got this picture of a person is that he says that if you could stand back far enough from heaven, it would look like a person. All of the different communities in heaven would be like individual cells in the different organs that make up a person. So he talks about hell, consist, sorry, heaven consisting of tens of thousands of angelic communities. And yet the Lord leads them as one total angel or man. This is so because mutual love springing from the Lord's love exists among them all. And when that love exists among them all and within them all, they can all be arranged into the heavenly form, the nature of which is such that many are one and the more numerous they are, the stronger is their oneness. They are like the countless parts of the human body, although these are distinct and various, they nevertheless make one. And, and one of the things I find so valuable about this picture is the idea of valuing difference. You think about the human body, we are all, you know, we're made up of all of these different parts. And the fact is, you know, we need eyes, we need ears, we need a brain, we need a liver, we need a heart. These are all different things. Um, it, would no, it wouldn't be any good if we were all an eye, if we're all a heart. We need to be different. And, and so that, this idea of valuing difference is really built into his philosophy. Um, and so I've got just another one here that I wanted to share with you. Doctrine is one when all possess mutual love or charity. Charity causes all things, though varied, to be one. If all, no matter how many, are governed by charity, they have one end in view, namely the common good, the Lord's kingdom and the Lord himself. Variations in matters of doctrine and forms of worship are like the variations that exist with the physical senses, with the inner parts of man's body, which, as stated, all contribute to the perfection of the whole. So it's just a lovely picture of um, the way all of these different parts must be different, yet they are part of one. He has a very particular view on the Bible. 
He talks about the way the Bible has an inner meaning to it. It's not just the surface meaning. So he makes this comment. <clears throat> Regarded in themselves, historical narrations can do little to lead to a person's change for the better and nothing whatever to bring him to eternal life. To enter heaven and, its ex and experience its joy, that is eternal life, souls have no need of anything except that which is the Lord's and which derives from him. It is for the sake of these things that the word, the Bible, exists. And these are the things which it contains interiorly. So I just wanted to talk about how he sees this, um, this inner meaning working. He has this idea he calls a science of correspondences. And it, it's the idea that a physical thing has something spiritual to which it corresponds. And I'll give you an example in a tick. But he says this, in the natural world and in its three kingdoms, not even the smallest thing exists which does not represent something in the spiritual world. That is, which does not have in that world something to which it corresponds. So my example is light. We say, I see. What do we mean? We mean, I understand. You see, there's a connection between the idea of light and the understanding, the idea of truth. So when we look at something like the creation story in the Bible, the first thing that's created in, in the Bible is light. God said, let there be light. And for us, what it is, it's the first spiritual awakenings, the first spir spiritual realization that a person comes to. So I thought of something like the first time empathy dawns on a child. You know, when a child in their interaction suddenly realizes the person I'm interacting with is another person just like me with needs and desires. And those needs and desires need to be treated with respect, the same kind of respect I'd expect my own needs and desires to be dealt with. That's a dawning realization. That's the light opening up. So that's an example of this, let there be light in the creation story. So that's just a simple example of the way Swedenborg looks at the whole of the Bible in these, these terms of correspondences. He also talks about what he calls accommodation. He says the Bible is revealed, or it's God revealing himself, but it's written in a language that we understand. Because a divine truth is just beyond all of us. Now, we, we, we cannot understand the, the universe the way God understands it. So it's written in our language, but it has its limitations. And the anger of God is one of them. You know, that, that's the way, that's the culture to which the Bible was written, this idea of the angry God. And so, so Swedenborg writes this, in the word, anger and wrath are attributed to the Lord, but they are in man. And it is so expressed because such is the appearance to man when he is punished and damned. And it says also, evil is also attributed to the Lord, although nothing but good is from him. Because if you remember, I said before, God is love. And God is not capable of being angry in the way that mankind is capable of being angry. That's Swedenborg's idea. All right, and move on to worship. He wrote, <clears throat> it is commonly believed that worship of God means a declaration of the lips in a place of worship. But true worship of God consists in a life of useful purpose. Any declaration of the lips is entirely meaningless unless it flows from this true worship in everyday living. And this idea of use is one that's um, spoken to a lot of members of our, of our church quite deeply. I wanted to talk about salvation. Who can enter heaven and how? Lovely passage from heaven and hell. Swedenborg wrote, 
It is not as hard to follow the path to heaven as many people believe. The only difficulty is finding the power to resist love for ourselves and love of the world and preventing those loves from taking control since they are the source of all our evils. So when we then think about other religions, um, we find Swedenborg saying something which is quite remarkable for the time in which he wrote. Remember, he was born 1688, 1772. In the Christian church at the time, it was believed that only Christians could go to heaven. Um, but Swedenborg contradicted that. He wrote this, no one is born for hell. The Lord is actually love itself and his love is an intent to save everyone. So he provides that everyone shall have some religion. An acknowledgement of the divine being through that religion and an inner life. That is living according to one's religious principles is an inner life for then we focus on the divine. So to have that recognition of other religious systems at that time was quite astonishing. Uh, this is my, one of my personal favorites, this little, this saying here. He says, if charity was the essential thing of the church, all would be governed by the Lord as though they were one person. Everyone would then say of one another, no matter what form his doctrine and his external worship take, this is my brother. I observe that he worships the Lord and is a good man. And it's sayings like that and, and statements like that, of which there are many, that inspired this man. Oh, is it going to show it? There we go. Um, Charles C. Bonney. Charles C. Bonney was a member of the new church. And he was one of the leading lights in the first world parliament of religions. So it comes, it's inspired directly from Swedenborg's, Swedenborg's work and the new church. Well, I've tried to give you a very quick overview of, of what Swedenborg teaches and what the new church believes. Um, if you want to know more, you can go to our website, which is um, swedenborgcommunityvictoria.net.au. And you can also search for us on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and YouTube and Google, and you should, you should find us. Um, so I'm going to draw a line under it there. Thank you very much for listening to me. I know I've given you a lot to, to read, um, but as I say, they were, they were quite important to me. And I, you know, I, I sat on the computer, you know, during the week thinking, oh, no, I'll put that in. No, no, this is better. So there's, there's lots there I could have shared with you um, today. Um, so I'll open up for questions. Um, Sithi, do you want to moderate questions? I've got... There was, there was where I think what the that oh, well, I've, I've got... I've got some, I've got them written here. Okay, okay. I'll ask the first question if you don't mind. Yeah. Can you read, can you read it? No. You'll have to come to the microphone so you can be heard. I, I think it's uh, very hard for me. Would you like I me to? Ask, yeah. Would you like me to yeah. read it? That's uh, fine. Can I ask the first question? Oh, oh I see. Yes, yes. Uh, Reverend Swingberg, Swing, Swedenborg. Swedenborg. Yeah. Swedenborg. We never knew about it till I met you. Yes. I never knew about it. Yes. Was he a Christian before? He was. Yes, was that's right. Yes. So his father was a Lutheran bishop in the Christian church in Sweden. Yes. So he was raised a Christian and maintained a Christian faith all of his life. But, and also, did you change uh, later to this or were you born as a... I was born into the church. Oh, ah, okay. Yes. Thank you very yeah. much. My father was also a minister. Uh, Ah, okay, and also I just like to tell the group uh, you said that Islam is as well. It is said all those who believe in the oneness of God mm. will enter heaven one day. Mm. So it's not only the Muslims; mm. all people who believe in one God will enter heaven one day. So, which means God will forgive even when we do sin, we go to help us. Yeah, 
God will forgive and come to heaven one day. So I just want to tell that our yeah. teacher is very close to what uh, yeah. your priest was. Yes, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Sissy. I, I think I'm going to ask David to do it. I can't read without oh, my okay. glasses. No, that's fine. So I've got a question from Shashi. And he's written, the way I understand the difference between mainstream Christianity and this sect is the life after the death. Is it true? Love is common to all the faiths and every way of living in this universe. True. Um, so one of the interesting things, if you go to. I don't want to talk in I don't want to generalize too much because there's there's very you know, there's different opinions across the board, but I know that I, I've had friends in other Christian churches who've said, well, we die. And then there's the second coming and the last trumpet, and then we're all raised to life again. So Swedenborg says, no, that's not the case. What Swedenborg says is we die and we're almost immediately raised to new life in a spiritual world, not a physical one. It takes on the appearance of a physical world um, and it, it works in, in very similar ways to the physical world, but it's a spiritual world. It's not the physical one. So, and this is where he says, you know, he claimed to have these experiences while he was living in the physical world. He was also experiencing in the spiritual world at the same time, like a dual consciousness. So that's, that's his understanding. Sithi? So I'll, I'll just get you to. Yeah, I'd just like to ask then when he says uh, you live in, you are not, you are, uh, what did you say? That he, you are born again into a not, not this physical world, but to another world. What is the other world? Like, what is it the other world is like? What is the other world like? Very like this one in many ways. You know, we have homes and we have mountains and trees and gardens. Um, but I would say the difference between the physical world and the spiritual world. Oh, is sorry, the, that's the word I was looking at, yeah, spiritual world. The spiritual world responds to our own inner nature. And so it manifests what our own inner nature to us. And this is the difference between heaven and hell. If we are loving, the world that manifests around us is a loving world because it reflects our own nature back to us. If we are selfish, it reflects back to us a selfish world and we surround ourselves with people like us who are selfish. Um, and so this is where Swedenborg then describes things like, you know, caves and caverns and dark corners and all these sorts of things. Um, and this idea of hellfire that we pick up in the Bible is this, is actually, it's just selfish love, which stirs people up. So that's, that's the, that's the difference. Yeah. Do you want to hand that? How do you distinguish between body and soul? That is between physical world and the spiritual world. Well, I mean, I don't have... You, you will see that after yeah. after death, I mean, uh, you land into the spiritual world. Yes. So does it mean that the soul that you say, it uh, migrates to a spiritual world? Uh, it never comes back in the physical shape. That's what... Yes, we. Do, that's right. We do believe that it doesn't come back into another physical body. But so, this is, I mean, this is, I mean, uh, uh, different from the Hindu point of view, Hinduism. Yes. They say that when the person dies, the soul goes away for some time. Yes. And then it takes rebirth in some other form of life. Yes. Other human maybe or other creature maybe. Yes. So it comes back, returns to physical form. Yes. In the shape of another physical body. Yes, maybe that's human, right. maybe not non-human because there are... Uh, millions of creatures yes and yeah. all of them have some sort of soul yes so yeah. that hindu philosophy believes in the migration of soul from one body to a different form of physical. yes yeah yeah so yeah it's it's illustrative of the fact that we we do have different beliefs about about you know life after death and what happens you know when we die but i think the thrust of it is in in all cases you know whether i talk about a single life and then life in heaven or hell or you talk about many lives the thing is that the life that you live now is important to determine that outcome you see and that's the that's the important thing and that's the common ground is that we're all 
you know, urged to act in good ways because, you know, for the Hindu, it will mean a better reincarnation. Yeah, and, for yeah. for the Christian, it will mean, you know, heaven rather than hell. Yeah, um, you always yeah. said that whatever you do in this life, yes. right, in the next life, that will be manifested. Yes. You will get yeah. a better opportunity, a yeah. better life. Yes. Yeah. You do good things in this life. Yes, and that's the same but, yeah, sort of idea. Thought, but if yeah. you indulge in vice or something like that, hmm. probably you will be degraded in the next, yeah. the next life. Yeah. 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 So Stan has asked, can you please explain how Swedenborg's charity is more than cold charity? Um, so yes, we use this term charity and it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean just giving to charity or, you know, volunteering your time at Vinnie's or whatever else. It's, it's actually a way of life. It's all about um, living, loving principles, doing your best at work, um, doing your best in every sphere of life is is what he calls charity love for the neighbor so that's i hope that answers your question stan um uh, now uh, roland has written um swedenborg was clearly a, rem a remarkable person the farmer father of the physical psychical tradition in religion Swedenborg rejected the Trinity, but he himself stayed in the Lutheran Church. How are we to account for this? And is not Swedenborg advancing his spiritual experience, but yet we have the problem of subjectivity. Why is his teaching authoritative? Lots of good questions. Um, <laughs> in one. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So. Oh. Swedenborg was clearly a remarkable person, the father of the psychical tradition in religion, psychical. So he was very influential in the 19th century with the rise of spiritism, you know, the Ouija boards and contacting the, the dead. That, so those people also look to Swedenborg's work. Um, the new church, I must say, doesn't. We don't conduct seances and try and contact the dead. Uh, we more focus on what Swedenborg wrote about the Bible, but he certainly was influential in that tradition as well. Um, but then he says, Swedenborg rejected the Trinity, but he himself stayed in the Lutheran church. Yes, Swedenborg, he talks about one God, not three persons, uh, three individual people, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He talks about the what these Father, Son, and Holy Spirit represent in the Bible. So Father is love, the Son is wisdom, and the Holy Spirit is use. It's it's useful action. Um, but he stayed in the Lutheran church um, because Swedenborg never sought to create his own separate denomination. Um, the, the group of churches known as the New Church formed 15 years or more after his death but he always stayed within his own religious tradition. I think his own expectations seem to have been that his writing would be accepted by the wider Christian church over a period of time. Um, he did, but he did, so he didn't start a denomination in his own. He, con he did continue to attend his own Lutheran church. <clears throat> um, and is not Swedenborg advancing his spiritual experience but yet we have the problem of subjectivity. Why is his teaching authoritative? Um, an excellent question. So Swedenborg, Swedenborg explored his own inner workings, his own inner life. And so you can say that when he went, when he had these interactions with, with um, angels and with demons, he was interacting on an inner level, 
kind of with his own psychology almost. You see what I mean? Because remember what I said about heaven, that heaven is a manifestation of what is within you. The spiritual world is a manifestation outwardly of what is within. So that's what Swedenborg is connecting with. He's connecting with spirits and angels who represent or um, represent something that's going on within himself. Why is it authoritative? I would say that what Swedenborg wrote has a lot of common ground with a lot of other truths and principles in the world. Um, if you look at um, near-death experience, such as people like Raymond Moody have done, there are many, many common threads. Um, and we see that what Swedenborg wrote, it wasn't just all about his own narrow experience. It was something that is commonly experienced by many people across many different cultures. So for me, what he wrote, yes, it was subjective. It was about his own experience, but I think there's very much of it which has been verified by others doing, you know, on similar sorts of journeys. That's that Roland is my um, is my response to that that question. Um, Thank you. Oh, we've got a whole pile of others have come in. How how long do you want to go on, Sithi, before we finish? Oh. We have time. Yep. Okay. Um, I just see if there's any. I noticed Shashi, you've written a few, but I'm just going to go to some other other folk who've written questions as well. Um, David Cohen has written that would be charity, as in the King James Bible of 1611. Yes, that would be right, which is generally now translated as love. Yes, um, and you use the word love a lot, but your definition is circular. Below is a definition from Sam Harris that is not circular. I'd like to know if this agrees with your idea of love. So Sam Harris wrote, to be made happy by the happiness of others, reflexive joy at the joy of others. I think that's pretty good. I think that's pretty good. I mean, I'll, I'll go back to what I said before. <clears throat> so Swedenborg's definition of love I shared with you right at the beginning under when we spoke about God. So this is what he wrote. Um, the essence of love is not to love self, but to love others and through love to be conjoined with them. It is also the essence of love to be loved by others, for thus is conjunction achieved. So love in Swedenborg's view is a two-way process. To be truly satisfactory, it must be this two-way. Um, there is certainly that love that we show to others, which is not reciprocated, you know, um, the idea of forgiveness, for example, where, you know, Jesus talks about the way we should forgive others, even if they don't forgive us. Um, but it's most satisfactory when it's returned, when it's reciprocated. So I think, I think I agree with what Mr. Harris wrote. Um, all right. Uh, and then I'll go back to some others. Uh, was that Shashi's first one? So Shashi wrote, if time permits, I would like to read a small story relating to positive and negativity in our attitude, way of thinking and related actions. Um, that's going to be a problem, Shashi, just because of sound, I'm sorry. It might have to be something we share post-meeting. Um, I think... I think that's all the questions from online. Does anybody face to hate face have any questions they want to raise? I will ask you to use this so you can be heard. Thank you. Uh, David, you mentioned, I believe twice that God does not get angry, but in the Old Testament, we have a few cases mm -hmm that God was angry with people and uh, the stories that we know about it. So how do you explain those situations? Yeah. Please? So Swedenborg talks about two related words. One of them is appearance 
and the other one is accommodation. I mentioned accommodation this evening. So appearance is the way something looks. Um, and what he says is that the way something looks is not the way it always is internally. So you think about <clears throat> you think about a parent getting angry with a child. So from the child's point of view, the parent is very angry and cross and oh daddy doesn't love me anymore. But the inner reality should be that daddy does. The daddy does love me, that actually his anger is stimulated by you know his love for me because he doesn't want to see me get hurt. So God, in his inner essence, is love. And it's incapable of anger, but it might seem that way um, to the person who's experiencing it on the other end. You think about the criminal sentenced in court. So the criminal sentenced in court will look at the judge <clears throat> and will think, oh, the judge hates me, you know, he, He's not in, you know, he wants to get rid of me or he'll do anything he can to, to destroy me. But the judge should be working from a different motivation. The judge should be working from the motivation of uh, reform of that person. So there's different processes going on. It's the way it looks and the way it truly is within. And that's, so that's how we would talk about it. So this idea of appearance is very strong in, in Swedenborg when he writes about the Bible, that there are things in the Bible that appear a certain way, but the inner reality of them is quite different. And this is where we also get this idea of accommodation, that the Bible is written in a language we understand. So, you know, the Bible doesn't mention Wi-Fi and CDs and the internet. Why not? Well, because the, those things never existed when it was written. It would be nonsense, wouldn't it, to have been those things to be written and space travel to be written into the Bible 2,000, 3,000 years ago. People wouldn't have accepted it. They wouldn't have um, taken it seriously. But they needed to take the Bible seriously for the inner lessons that they learn from it. And it's the inner stuff that's important, not the outer stuff. So that's, does that help? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Anyone else uh, David, can I ask uh, again, this physical world and the spir uh, spiritual world? <clears throat> now, you, you said, like, you go to the spiritual world once you die. What about the people who didn't have love or didn't follow the religion? What spiritual world do they go to? Something I didn't mention about the spiritual world is that we're all already there. We are all already there. We have a spiritual body. We're just not conscious of it. We are surrounded by spiritual beings. We're just not conscious of them. They have their effect upon us, but we're not aware of it. We're aware of this physical world. So when we die, what happens is we lose our body. Our body ceases to function and we kind of disconnect and we are in a spiritual, a spiritual world. Um, Swedenborg's process of judgment, if there is one, he calls this thing, he calls it the world of spirits. And the world of spirits is kind of where we wake up. It's, the, it's where we already are and it's full of a mix of different spirits, good and bad. And it's where we discover our own inner nature. That's where our inner nature starts to show itself, to reveal itself. And we find our path to our spiritual home. Now, that might be heaven or it might be what he describes as hell. But the interesting thing about Swedenborg's hell is it's, it's what I think heaven is. If I am hellish, I go there because I think that's heaven. It's where I get to go and exercise my loves, whatever they are. But if I am selfish and I go to a place where I get to exercise selfish loves, it will be filled with other people who are also exercising their selfish loves. 
Now you can see how that's not going to work because if we're all exercising selfish loves, we're all against one another. Whereas if we're exercising loving loves, if we're exercising a love for other people, it works because, you know, I look after you, you look after me and we are happy together, you see, and that's, that's how it works. So he has this interesting idea that hell is actually heaven for those who go there because it's where they get to exercise their loves. It just doesn't work. Does that answer your yeah, question sort of i think yeah. we need to have more discussions yeah. <laughs> because it, yeah. this is a new uh, new religion like to us yes indeed new culture indeed. or whatever you call it is that can we pass the microphone across sorry and then to ashan uh, just a short question yeah uh, when a person is dead i mean unconscious what is the relevance of we what is the relevance of the word we because we does not exist you are dead. Then you say that we go into the spiritual world. Yeah. So what is the meaning of that we? We yeah. never exist. Yeah. So for Swedenborg, as I yeah. say, we um, we are already in a spiritual world with a spiritual body yeah. as well as having a physical body. So for him, death, what we call death, is just the, the, the ceasing to function of the physical body. We, in Swedenborg's view, still exist. And we transfer our consciousness from here to there. And that, that's his idea. So it, it's a different idea, yeah. for sure. Yes, but that's, that's how he understands it. Uh, Ms. Sean? Thanks, Graham. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure whether this makes any difference or not. Does it? Oh, you'll be heard much better. Uh -uh. Yes. You okay. can't hear it, but people online. Can. Oh, they, they can hear yes, it. Okay, yes. good, good. That's okay. Um, you mentioned that the explanation for the uh, things from the Bible is is done by uh, Swedenborg, which is great. I would like to know how does he describe the the phrase that says that God created man in His own image? Yeah. Right. So to be, if you are here, yeah. if you are having these qualities. Right of being of being able of love yeah. and capable of love yeah. and capable of hate or capable of anger. That image is also reflected from God to us. Oh, right? I That's, see. Right. So if you are okay. image of Him, so therefore we cannot say that He is incapable of anger. How does He explain that, please? Mm. So if you go back to the Genesis story, um, so the, the Genesis story you've got in chapters one and two, you've got the creation story and you've got the creation of Adam and then the creation of Eve. And then you've got that chapter, chapter three, that story of the fall where, you know, there's the, there's the tree in the center of the garden and, and uh, Eve takes of the fruit and they eat and they, their eyes are opened. Now, Swedenborg takes that all spiritually. He doesn't believe it happened uh, you know, physically, um, it's all, all has spiritual meaning. But what I would say to your question, in response to your question, in terms of being in the likeness and image of God, we are what Swedenborg describes a will and an understanding. So the will is for for him the seat of our love. The understanding is the seat of our wisdom or the seat of our, our truth, how we understand the world. And these are two parts of our mind that work together. Now, in Swedenborg's understanding, we are created to love. We're not created to hate. You see, we're created to love. And we're created in such a way that our understanding, our wisdom, um, helps us to work out how to love better. Okay. What's happened with the fall is that we've taken that love and we've turned it on ourselves. So we then have focused on self love rather than other love, loving someone else. I've put myself in first priority, first place. And when we start doing things like that, we become angry, we become wrathful. Um, and so we've, 
corrupted the image of God. So again, Swedenborg would say God does not get angry. He does not hate. We do that. And because we do it, we project it onto God and say, oh, God does these things too, because that's our experience of life. That's, that's the way I'd respond to that. Yeah. That's all right. One more question, please. Uh, okay, I have to bring my thoughts together. Uh, please explain to me where does God come into Swedenborg ideology? And uh, with, with so many different branches or sects, I don't know, uh, of Christianity, mm. <clears throat> how do people know what to believe? Mm. Sorry, I am... No, I understand. Bit, no, that's fine. Uh, to, me, to me, the way I look at it, uh, Reverend Swedenborg is still a Lutheran. Am I right? He remained a Lutheran. He remained a yes. Lutheran. Yes. But his communication with angels, mm. the way I see it, his message is not from God. Okay. So how do I differentiate between the words of God or, or could I even say he could have been thinking about angels because not everybody comes to say, I've seen angels and I've been talking to angels. So I get a bit confused. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is this word of God? And where is the evidence of that? Yeah. Uh, one might say this is his imagination. Yes. That he's been talking to angels and saints. Mm -hmm. Yes. I would appreciate. No, that's fine. <laughs> the um, Many Thank people you. do say that it was all in his head. Many people do. Yeah. Um, Swedenborg himself is quite definite that he, uh, I, I referred to his um, spiritual crisis and his awakening, and he was quite firm that he saw the Lord Jesus Christ, whom he, whom he sees as God, giving him this commission. Uh, he's also quite definite that he, everything that he wrote, he did so under divine guidance. Okay. Now, whether you or anybody else accept that is entirely up to you. You meant, you know, you mentioned um, he remained a Lutheran all his life, which is one sect of Christianity, which is many, many different sects. But then, if you expand that even further and think about all of the different religions and all of the different sects of all the different religions as well. How do we know which one is true? How do we know which one is the right one? Now, Swedenborg's answer to that, and this is my understanding of Swedenborg's answer, is it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter because each of the religions has its divine origin. And each of the religions has something within it that God has revealed for the people of that religion so that they may find their way to heaven in their own way. This is one of the reasons why Swedenborg is not well known, because the new church has not been good at promoting itself, you see. And one of the reasons we're not good at promoting itself ourselves is that I actually have no interest in converting you to my religion, because your religion is right for you, just as my religion is right for me. And I find that personally wonderful. Um, which is why I'm involved in MIG, because it, 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 you know, it's a celebration of all of this great variety of 
perspectives and understandings which ultimately make our lives richer. It actually doesn't matter whether I know the truth. It's got, you know, I uh, always say, admission to heaven is not by examination. It's by the way that we live. It's by our love for one another. It, 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 so it doesn't matter. <laughs> How's that? It doesn't matter. Um, Shashi sent me this thing that he would like me to read. Is that okay if I read that? This? Shall we give Heather a chance to ask a question? First? Oh, yes. Because... Okay. Heather, would you like to answer, ask a question? Heather's tucked away at the back, I should say. She's working all the technical equipment for me, which is very lovely. Uh, she's busy doing she's busy. Uh, the IT work. She has no questions. Oh, okay. All right. I'll read what Shashi has sent through. He uh, says, if time permits, can you read this story? It's called The Sun and the Cave. One day, the sun and a cave struck up a conversation. The sun had trouble understanding what dark meant. And the cave didn't quite get the hang of light and clear. So they decided to change places. The cave went up to the sun and said, ah, I see. This is beyond wonderful. Now come down and see where I have been living. The sun went down to the cave and said, gee, I don't see any difference. When the sun went down, it took its light along and even the darkest corners were illuminated. That's why the sun couldn't see the difference. One of the quotes says, the enlightened ones can never be sent to hell or pushed into darkness. They carry their heaven on their shoulders all the time. We were under the impression that heaven is a place where we should go. Now we realize it is our state of mind which imagines heaven or hell. If you are full of darkness, full of negativity, fear and doubt, you become a cave unknowingly. It's a hell within, and no matter how much you accumulate, you still remain hollow. On the other hand, if you are illuminated like the sun, then the darkness of the cave wouldn't matter. You could be in the worst of circumstances, yet you will still be able to find a blessing somewhere. Carry your light within you. Thank you, Shashi. That's lovely. It's a lovely, lovely story. Yeah. Any any more questions for you? I think I've, ru I've run out online. Okay. I'm not going to wait too long because I've got plenty more. <laughs> but yeah, it seems like we've we've finished up online. Okay. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, it was very interesting and something new that we learned. Probably we have a lot of more questions for you when we meet again. Oh, that's fine. Because uh, it's a new concept. Yeah. so yeah. it's yeah. that's why it's a bit confusing for everybody yes else. of course yeah yeah, yeah you're like the jewish religion really, not converting anybody else yeah so other yeah. jews yeah and Thanks. also with sufism uh, we believe you can reach heights to go higher and higher to get knowledge and meet the high other people at the higher end mm -hmm. like what you're saying he was able to speak with the angels yes yeah yeah but through sufism you can do that mm -hmm. i also want to thank heather today for managing our zoom yes. and being there listening thank you hands are full. <laughs> and thank uh, and uh, thank you david as well and is there any announcements from anybody 